Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our panel discussion. We haven't had a panel at DNOC in, I don't know, five plus years. So Thomas had the great idea to restart it and brought a, uh, together a nice group of us. Um, Tim will soon introduce everyone. But first of all, we're going to discuss 400 weeks today. Uh, I hope you have all listened yesterday uh, during Andy's talk and took quite some notes, because that's what's going to be all about today. Just to give you a rough uh, red line on what we're going to talk about, uh, you're seeing in the bottom right the uh, circles. And we're going to start in the data center, uh, discuss how 400 gig, gig can help us here. Then we move forward to the uh, IXP dash interconnection layer. So we have our own data center. Now we want to interconnect with someone else. Then we'll move into the metro network. So let's say this is a 40 kilometers range somewhere uh, within the same city or in the same region. And thereafter, we'll expand even further and talk a bit about long haul. So that's it from me. Tim, please introduce everyone else. Yeah, hello, everyone. And um, thank you for having us here. Um, I'll introduce um, the participants in this uh, round. And I'll start with uh, Theo Voss from Annexia. Theo, please. Yes, uh, yeah, my name is Theo Voss, uh, as most of you know from my uh, presentation yesterday. Um, I'm head of network engineering for Annexia. And 400 gig is for us a very promising standard for the future. We are currently looking into this a lot, especially um, yeah, due to our profile as a uh, yeah, carrier slash enterprise slash service provider with a lot of locations globally, more into um, yeah, solutions with less, oper less operational effort and uh, also reduce complexity, but also into a high number of 100 gig links compared to a high number of links on, on one single stretch. So we're looking into interconnecting multiple locations by one times 400 gig uh, instead of like high capacities on one stretch as uh, maybe others in this um, panel do. Okay, then we have um, Daniel Melzer from DEKIX. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Metzer from DKIX and I work for DKIX for quite a long time. At the moment as a network architect and uh, Fornergy is uh, highly interesting for us um, for the customer side, customer connections as well for the backbone connections. Today we run um, a lot of legs link aggregation groups combining four, five, six, eight, nine um, times 100G and there's certainly need for 400G in the near future. And at the, this point we really would have uh, wanted to introduce someone from an FTDH um, operator but unfortunately uh, we weren't able to um, find anyone so for the next dean or conference if you're operating um, a maybe larger FTDH network um, this uh, could be interesting to have you in uh, the, the conference, maybe for a talk or the next panel, um, whatever will come up. Uh, but let me introduce Florian Hippler from Arista. Hi, my name is Florian. Um, as Tim just mentioned, I work for Arista as a systems engineer. Uh, 400 gig for us is not only important in the hyperscaler space, um, but we also see a lot of benefits from 400 gig technology improving existing 100 gig technologies. And therefore, um, yeah, this is something I would like to discuss with the people here today. Okay, and then we have Harald Bock from Infinera, please. Hello, my, my name is Harald Bock. I, I work in Infinera's CTO office and I'm responsible for, for network and technology strategy. Um, for us, 400, Gig and in particular 400 gigabit Ethernet arrived as a as a as a service rate which our equipment transports uh, a short while ago and we, we for us this is pretty much technology that we sell today and that we deploy today um, in on the line side of our WDM systems 400 gig is one of the main line rates which we deploy when we when we deploy one of our up to 800 gig WDM line interfaces. So for us, 400 gig is, is very much there, there today, and we see a lot of new applications for that coming up right now. And last but not least, Thomas Weibel from FlexOptics. 
Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, my name is Thomas, Thomas Weibler from Flex Optics, uh, co-founder and uh, CTO. And uh, let, let's say like this 400 gig is now for me the third revolution in optical networking. What happened in the last 10 years, I'm, I'm with Flex Optics now, uh, started basically with the bleeding edge of 10 gig uh, these days uh, back. And now uh, 100 gig is definitely around. And now we are talking about 400 gig, which is definitely a, a very, very interesting to talk about. And I'm really happy that we have this nice crowd together because I think this is quite unique uh, or unique uh, unicorn setup, having all those people together from different areas uh, with the need and also what, what kind of possibilities they can offer uh, as a system vendor or manufacturer uh, to have a, now a discussion here at Dino. I'm really happy about it. Thank you very much. Okay, then I would say that we can start in the um, uh, in the panel, and uh, we will start um, with a smaller um, length, like in the data center. Um, it's probably a good start to look at um, with which optics uh, you would start, and maybe uh, why should I care about 400G in the data center? I have enough fibers there, so I could just um, throw with fibers. Um, on the problem and just gave a lot of more 100G um, thoughts. Yeah, so that's true. And to start with, I think I'm going to catch up uh, from the presentation from last night or yesterday evening from Andy Bechtel's time when he talked about OSFP and QSFPD, QSFPDD, uh, the new form factors for 400 gig. I made a small comparison of both of them to, to give the audience a rough idea what uh, what are the benefits of it. So, uh, and there's nothing much I can add actually to, to Andy's uh, speech uh, yesterday. The OSFP is definitely the, uh, the pluggable form factor which can uh, hold and uh, uh, get rid of the most heat because it has just a, big, a bigger size compared to a QSFP DD. So in lab environment today, it's already possible to, to go up, up to 20 watts of uh, power consumption and also at the end of the day heat dissipation. And the great advantage of OSFP is, is as well that he is ready for, for 800 gigs so for the next uh, revolution or evolution uh, in optics. Uh, so the footprint is already defined, which is pretty great. On the other side, we do have the QSFP DD. Uh, DD uh, stands for double density. It has a pretty unique or nice setup because it's backwards compatible to QSFP28, which we broadly use in today's network for 100 gigabit transceivers. So in a 400 gigabit QSFP DD slot, you are able to plug in a QSFP28, which is pretty great when it comes back to backwards compatibility. And um, the, the, the last point here is it's very popular. So comparing QSFPD, QSFPDD with OSFP, the maturity of system manufacturers went or jump on the uh, on the QSFPDD and uh, on the public available components, only Arista is currently on the OSFP. Um, that's something um, which I think differentiate here pretty much. Right. Yeah, probably then also adding just a few words here from my side. I mean, um, as, as Thomas already said, uh, Arista is like the only vendor jumping on the OSFP right now. Um, but also then from the other perspective, I mean, we're on the verge of, well, it's kind of a new evolution. We're looking at 100 gigabit, 400 and 800 gigabit. So we're somewhere in the middle right now. Um, I think it's still up to every um, uh, every well network itself to decide if they want to go for like I want to be 800 gig ready from from a transceiver perspective mm. or be backwards compatible because I have so many optics. So I think this is more or less the the, the point here. Yeah. I should just maybe add an example at this point. If you look at a network like ours with a lot of pops globally, where we try to keep all the, the equipment, all the blueprints we have as agnostic as possible in terms of technology. Uh, and you might have a different requirement in, in Sao Paulo than in Frankfurt, but shipping the same gear uh, to reduce the complexity, the, the backwards compatibility is, is a big key for us, for example, um, and makes the decision for us uh, or shifts the decision um, much into the, the QSFP DD direction. Mm. Yes, the same is true for us. So 
we see the advantages of uh, OSFP, but at the same time, we um, need the flexibility from the QSFP form factor. Um, that's one point. And the second point is um, on the paper, there is a, a broad support for OSFP, but in fact, um, if you want to buy a gear, it's as of today, more or less just a wrist down, right? If you go to the other ones, um, there is nothing. Yeah, but what is really and, important um, to mention, oh, sorry, go ahead then. <laughs> yeah. Go. Okay, me too. Um, yeah. Um, but I think what's really important to mention when we are looking in the data center scope um, that, like, being ready for 800 gig and also taking into consideration the physics that the OSFP really has an advantage when it comes to technology leadership. So the latest and greatest technology in optical components will always, most probably will always be implemented first in OSFP. So if you want to be the first having 800 gig equipment, then um, the OSFP really helps there. It, it will always be a little bit ahead because it's uh, it can carry the load easier compared to a QSF PDD. Okay, that, that makes sense what you all said. And I think we have very interesting aspects on, on both sides. I see Theo's point where he says that they are building rather small pops and they, they need the backwards compatibility, but maybe to, to challenge you on, on this and especially maybe Daniel, uh, you have all your own data centers um, and let's maybe get more into the direction of big data centers, big data center fabrics, where we don't really see the need for having um, a backwards compatibility, but rather as much bang for the buck as possible. Uh, do you still see QSF PDD in that case? Um, this is maybe to Daniel and Florian. Um, do you still see QSF PDD there as the leader because we still have the option of ca uh, backwards compatibility? Or would you rather jump on the feature train uh, as, as Thomas briefly highlighted? Uh, to get the newest and greatest features uh, in an OSFP within your data center where let's say uh, backwards compatibility and also size, maybe adding a new device doesn't really matter. So for us, it's so it, in the end, it's a trade-off, right? Um, we have very big sites like Frankfurt, which is way ahead of all the rest. And then we have a lot of uh, smaller sites, New York, for instance, and really small sites and we try to get um, the same hardware for all the sites or made it, make it fit for all the sites. And um, if you look at that, then QSF PDD or QSF P form factor is um, the best option as of today. So I'm with uh, Florian, uh, if you look um, in the future, maybe it's the, the wrong way or there is a better way, yes. But if you look today, or if you want to buy hardware today, so there is no real choice, right? Um, In our case, at least. Mm -hmm. as, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of said it. The uh, backwards compatibility is, I mean, obviously there is also backwards compatibility with an OSP form factor. Um, with <laughs> Daniel <laughs> laughing because he knows, so there is a passive adapter essentially. <laughs> which transforms an OSFP port into a QSF PDD port, uh, QSFP port, sorry. Um, on the other side, a neither OSFP or QSF PDD port is just an extremely expensive 100 gig port, if you see it from that perspective. Um, so I think no matter kind of which op uh, optic you would choose, or if you say you wanna go future compatibility on um, 400, 800 gig, versus backwards compatibility on 100 gig, you probably choose a switch which has QSFP 28 100 gig ports plus a few OSFP or QSF PDD ports so that you can satisfy both worlds without burning actually um, ports or port speeds. Yeah, just to, just to get back on the pricing um, topic you mentioned. So uh, that's, I think, important to keep in mind. I mean, it depends on the network you're running, but. In our case, the price point for the particular port um, might be less important to us than the costs of operating, maintaining, uh, qualifying, kind of let's say 10 different type of boxes um, just to make sure to ship the, the perfect box to each location at the end. So, which also might block the, the upgrade path at some point. 
So I would recommend in terms of pricing, not to only focus on the port price or single port price or the, the transceiver price, but also let's keep the big picture in mind in this case. At least for us, that's super important. Okay, thank you. Well, for, for, us it's, for us, it's also not only comparison 100G port and the 400G port out of the same port or line card, it's more the mix we can get of a line card. So it's a mix of 100 gig, 400 gig, maybe breakouts out of 400 gig ports, uh, so four times 100 gig or 10 times uh, 10 gig out of 100 gig ports. So this is all the flexibility we can get mm -hmm. out of the hardware today. Um, yes, maybe it's possible with adapter, but um, in the past I've uh, used adapters only for corner cases um, where we had uh, the need for a special <laughs> solution. But um, it's not not to use it for all ports, right? But mm. maybe it's an option. But as I said before, there is just also no hardware available as of today. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so first and foremost, uh, one thing I forgot in the introduction, if you, uh, dear listeners, have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat with, as you're used to, prefixed by Q, and we will answer them in the end. We have reserved like 15 minutes for that. Um, but I had a question burning on my tongue at Andy's talk, but I was too busy to ask it there, so I'll ask it here. Um, <laughs> and with background focus for the data center, can we finally get rid of electrical, so copper-based connections with 400 gig, or is there still need for something like, I don't know, breakout cables with copper? Do you see anything like this? Is this necessary? <laughs> Or can we finally declare copper dead? Um, well, <laughs> Thomas, I have an opinion. I have an opinion. Um, <laughs> um, I really, I mean, you'd mentioned DACs, direct attached cables. Yes, they are cheap. They are, um, how to say, um, uh, broadly used. But yes, they make also a lot of trouble. And when I think about 400 gig direct edge cables they will be really more like a rod like really thick and you have cup plenty of them then you don't have to then you really have to think about all the mechanics how you just imagine 32 DACs thicker than my finger uh, on your line card this is a lot of tension on, on that line card so um, yes I totally agree um, would be great if we could get rid of DACs yeah um, well, at least from the uh, the 100 gig deployments I've seen so far, most of the servers are being shipped right now with 25 gig. Um, breakout cables, particularly in the in the classical enterprise space, you you see them on a daily basis. Um, usually, inside rack deployments are mainly built with duct cables. This is at least what I see from from my customers, and this is not a design decision made by Arista or something like this, because the duct cables are usually shipped with the servers. Um, but there we see a lot of breakouts, yes. And like the, the classical um, QSFP 28, 100 gig to four times 25, QSFP uh, 25. So yeah, this is, uh, I, I don't think they will disappear in the future. Um, the distances will get shorter, that's for sure. But I don't think they will, will really go away. I agree. I'm sad to hear it. Hi, uh, it's the way it is. Uh, Tim, do you have any further questions? Um, and I think we can uh, jump in with one question from the chat as it may as it relates to the uh, transceiver discussion right now. Um, uh, Andy talks about a higher failure rate of QSF DDD, and we also see already see them today in the networks. Um, has anybody a comparison from the field? Uh, from our side, I can say we see both. So we see DD or QSFP DD and OSFP requests. Um, I, I can't point to a direction where I see more. Um, um, it's balanced currently. Okay, so no, um, no higher rates right now in the field out there, but maybe too early to to say that. Yeah. Okay, let's um, move a little bit more to. Yeah. Oh, sorry. From experience, I, I would expect that a lot of the failure rates right now are still governed by the introduction of the new technology. So I don't think you would see fundamental differences between technologies at this stage, because even if you introduce new, new mechanical things like connector types, you will see failures at first 
because you're introducing something new. I think this is the same thing that we see with, with QSFPDD and OSFD right now. Mm. Okay. okay, then let's move more from the data center to our metro areas. And I think the interesting question would be how, what's the main advantage of having 400G than um, legacy 100G technologies in our metro applications? Okay, then probably let me start. Um, what I see there is up until probably a few well, weeks or months ago, um, 400 gig was pretty much well limited in, in, in range. Um, what came out now with the, um, and that, that's actually why 400 gig is a cool driver for 100 gig is the uh, single 100 gig Lambda LR optic which has a reach of four kilometers. The optic is cheaper than an LR4, but obviously it's incompatible with an LR4. Um, I think this is some of the great um, improvements we see from 400 gig towards 100 gig. And I hope it will become the, the, the new de facto standard actually for 400 gig because the optic is also more power efficient. Hmm. Um, from my point, I definitely see there is a huge improvement and I totally uh, agree to also to Andy's speech from, from uh, yesterday evening that we, when we look back to 10 gigabit networks in the metro area, we had really nice setups with uh, pluggables with SP plus DW demo before that XFP using a passive filter. Uh, it works straight out of your box if you want it, uh, using a passive filter and you were able to light up up to 80 kilometers, no issue, or when you had the filter, then maybe 60 kilometers, pretty easy with that. In the field of 100 gig, and um, we might uh, bring there slide number three, um, it, there was always a little bit an issue because QSFP 28, the really interesting form factor, didn't handle up to 25, roughly 40 kilometers. Now in the last couple of months, it came up to 80 kilometers, but not in a really nice setup. So you were really stuck somehow there to using proprietary technology and transponders or, um, uh, or the CFP2s. Now in 400 gig, this is a new, definitely new, a game changing uh, uh, game here now that again, the, the QSFP or OSFP, I, I don't point to the form factor now, but in basic that the, the technology itself, uh, how both are designed, you are able to light up again up to 80 or even more kilometers, um, which is pretty great. And it is, it is again possible uh, that you can do a similar setup like you did in the 10 gig world, if you want to. Which yeah, is we really see cool. that in particular in the metro areas where we operate a huge number of pops which are interconnected currently with one times 100 gig or multiple 100 gigs, but in most cases less than four times 100 gigs. So capacities, at least for us, are in the range between or where we're going to is between 100 and 400. So, um, and we operate all these, these links um, usually without any further equipment, so just point to point. So we see a big advantage, uh, especially cost wise. On the, on the ZR4 uh, variants of 100 gig and 400 gig um, to keep again for us the operational effort and the amount of devices or equipment um, and also the costs um, down in, in the metro areas. Yeah, and with uh, no yeah. matter, sorry, please. We see the same, so <clears throat> we have a, lo a long history using 10G uh, DWDM optics and at the time, one problem was um, that they were not uh, supported by the vendors. Um, and the second problem was that the uh, DWDM optics were long behind uh, the gray optics, right? So one to two years um, behind. And with Fronachi, there was just no option um, to do that. Uh, DWDM pluggables direct in the router and no with Fronachi, um all those uh, points are solved, or at least the promise is that uh, the points are solved. So we have um, the DWD implacables direct um, with the start of the form factor. We have um, support by the vendors. And I think um, 
as all the big ones um, looking for the solution. So for 400 G set set R and set R plus, um, there will also be a good price point in the end. So all the points not good in the past of 10 G or also 100 G are now solved hopefully. So for us, it's um, it's really interesting. Okay, so maybe quick question to the vendors here. Do you have any estimates or gut feelings? Will we ever get to CR plus? When will we get there? Um, and or do we when do we need to actually to add amplification here? Probably Harald first. So that's it. That's, that's a good question, right? So um, we have um, a word from some of the vendors and Thomas may add maybe some more details. Um, to get uh, 400 G setters, and I think end of this year, beginning of next year, we will have um, some samples or even um, ready products, and then it will be interesting to see how it performs, right? So our idea is to um, use the setters directly on the fiber to start small, then maybe add a filter to it to um, scale and um, we hope that we can use it at least in the in the metro area so um, for instance in frankfurt and on a short distances between maybe five to 20 kilometers so but we have to test it we have to prove it and if it works then it's then it would be nice otherwise we have to think about it yeah, no, it's definitely uh, that uh, we, we see them by the end of the year. So we most probably within November, we get the first samples in and they will have, will have roughly 11, 12 dB power budget. So then we will see how far we can get with filter, without filter. And the hope is there at least getting a reach with filter uh, up to 20 kilometers or even more. This is the goal. This would be great. And without external amplification. And in the theory, it should work when we do the math on the attenuation and uh, the other parameters, it should work. So uh, let's see by the end of the year, Christmas present. Mm -hmm. Arnold, do you have something? Yeah, actually, I think that this discussion shows to some extent how fragmented this metro market is because there are many, many very different things that we, that we look at as metro. I think what, what you just described is a very important part, especially in terms of volumes, which is very short reach 20, what I would call very short reach 20, 40, 80 kilometer for the 400 ZR up to 120 kilometer metro. Um, that is a pretty important field. It is something that in the past, actually, I, 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 uh, I, I don't see this as something that is a successor of uh, so much of a WDM system, but this is actually something that succeeds a lot of dark fiber interconnect between sites in the past. And um, um, if you move beyond that, then a lot of metro networks actually are the metro networks of, of, of telcos, of mobile operators, uh, actually have a, a much larger degree of complexity because they, they basically start with an aggregation stage that is beyond these 20 to 40 kilometers. So they, they, they extend to multiple tens of sites with um, a low number of hundreds of kilometers of reach. Um, and, and in order to efficiently run these networks, you, you also want to be able to interconnect wavelength bypass sites. So you, you, you will put rodems or other optical elements into them. And this is where, where, um, where uh, even with a 400 ZR approach, you, 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 run, you run into limitations very quickly. And this is why there are other applications, out, uh, other, other options for interfaces out there, which are also going to be successful. And we can see that actually in the analyst predictions, because when 400 ZR was announced, everybody was expecting the whole metro market will go to 400 ZR. And now things are starting to get more realistic because, because, um, because there are applications where this where this is a very, very important interface site. I mean, it'll certainly uh, sell a lot into these use cases, but there are other use cases where other things are needed. And that's both in terms of form factor, because we will see 400 ZR and 400 ZR plus in CFP2 D DCO form factors, because in that higher power form factor, you can actually extend reach, you can add additional features. Um, and features can be even be support for, for for client services that a, that a QSFP DD will not support um, or an OSFP. 
Um, and it can also be, as I said, reach and optical power level and so forth. The, the 400 ZR in the QFBDD will quite clearly have limits in terms of uh, the number of times you can go through a rodent or, or filter, the, the reach it'll be able to achieve, even amplified reach. So, so, so this is then where other solutions start. And those, the ones that are available today, then um, go, go up, today go up to 800 gig per wavelength. So you can see that, that the breadth of what a metro market is, is quite significant. And the, the most, actually the, the, the thing that is most different from what we've discussed so far is actually the US metro market where a typical city will have 120 rodent sites and uh, reaches that may end up being the low four digit or several hundred kilometers, maybe up to a thousand kilometers within a metro. Uh, that, that actually shows you, you can't address all that with a single format, not with a single uh, form factor, but also not with a single modulation type or module uh, or, 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 uh, or uh, even the same type of standardized interface. That does mm -hmm. just doesn't work. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you there. If you look at optical switching, um, that's probably a whole different story. If you look to, at point to point, the classical data center interconnect, um, that's probably a complete different story. Um, also, if you then look into the ZR, um, Andy presented yesterday the, um, uh, the, the colorless MOOCs, more or less. Um, it can be done in at least an OSFP form factor. Um, QSFP will for sure catch up, I'm, I'm pretty certain there. Um, but then on the other side, for most of the, uh, the companies, 400 gig on one fiber is actually quite some, um, quite some capacity. Most of them I see run one, two times 100 gig, probably on, on diverse fiber path. So if they would replace it with a single 400 gig set R in a metro, let's say 20, 30, 40 kilometer reach, um, that should do pretty much. Um, Thomas mentioned that the uh, first optic, uh, well, not Daniel, sorry, you were, uh, you mentioned it. Uh, the optics should arrive around this time, I guess, November um, in, in your lab. Um, I've seen them up and running in January in, in Santa Clara in our headquarters. This is the picture Andy showed yesterday in his presentation mm -hmm. as well. Um, so by that time, ZR Plus was not done, and I'm not 100% sure if it is uh, specified yet. But um, even from that perspective, Andy, I think, gave a pretty good um, demonstration description yesterday. I think yeah. 400, 400G ZR for the start is, is now something like an MSA. Yeah. yeah. But it's not, it is not the, speci the, the interoperability is not specified to a similar le level as the, the 400 ZR. Um, that's maybe something to note. The other thing is that the application you just mentioned is something uh, one 400G replacing a couple of 200 uh, of 100Gs. That is something you would probably do using a 400G ER. That's something that Andy mentioned as well yesterday. So, so you can see how fragmented this market is and how cost driven because there, there for, for specific applications and specific reaches, there are different different formats that are actually best. And 400 ZR certainly will have to play an important role, um, but it's not the whole metro. It's, it's, a, it's a certain part of the metro, it's, it's point to point, it's up to a certain reach and it's starting above a certain reach. Um, so, so you can see that, that, uh, that this, this market is actually very colorful, which makes it very exciting. <laughs> very colorful. Um, um, <laughs> Maybe I want, I want to add one thing there. I would like to combine the thing, uh, what Daniel said before, when he compared looking in the history a little bit about 10 gig. And what we all have to keep in mind is that in, in the 10 gig world, like ZR was never somehow standardized. And even DWDM was also not, let's say a pluggable DWDM was never on the roadmap of layer two and layer three equipment vendors. So it was more like some, uh, cowboys did there something and it's doable from the layer two and layer three equipment uh, make colorful light. Now, looking at 400 gig, all the homeworks were made correct. We have a nice form factor, which is nice and it's not like a bucket. It's a nice form factor. We have great heat dissipation and it doesn't matter if I'm talking about OSFP or QSFPDD, it doesn't matter. They are great. Um, 
nice heat dissipation. You can in integrate a lot of technology, and and that that's something I which which I think is really important. It has the awareness of all the windows that colorful light DWDM is now on the focus of layer two and layer three equipment, which is also unique, uh, or the first time uh, that this started, um, and so I see a a bright future of those pluggables uh, because especially when we look up to let's say 130 kilometers uh, which i still would dis define as metro uh and beyond that well let's see um yeah th these are my couple of cents probably one thing just to add to harald i think um especially with the ZR landscape um there's going to be a challenge for active wdm um suppliers Yeah, definitely. So that's what we try to, for example, is we try to eliminate active. I mean, every every active device has to be managed, has to be um, under support, etc. So we try to eliminate every single active optical device wherever possible. So um, that's why we see the big advantage in all these point-to-point uh, -point, uh, applications, for example. Okay, guys. Uh, I, I think we uh, agree. Okay, Harald, please con continue, but yeah. I'd like to switch topics thereafter, so but please make your last point. Maybe just to, to, to just one, one comment on that. Uh, where, where, where you can do that, where we can do that as an industry, that is of high value because, because um, removing equipment always is, is, is something that, that helps, that helps reduce power consumption, which is something that we as an industry should have as, an, as, a, as, a, as a goal for all of us together. Um, but there are many, many, there are many reasons why why um, starting from certain reaches, you still put your WDM equipment in because you just, I mean, transmitting something optically when you don't have to put some OEO conversion in between is just a lot lower power and a lot lower cost. The other thing is that, um, that today networks have become more complex in terms of their business models and, and structure of ownership. So um, in, in many use cases that we see, the owner of the router or packet switch is not the owner of the WDM gear. So, so you will have boxes that provide demarcation at lowest power and footprint and cost possible. You, there are very different use cases, even in Metro that, that require additional equipment. So we as WDM vendors, we are not at all worried about, about our future in that, in, in that field because, uh, because uh, there's plenty of space in this market for, for the, the additional functionalities these boxes provide, which range from just providing demarcation and potentially encryption, which is which actually encryption is one of these things that actually made in the past couple of year, years made a lot of data center operators buy separate boxes where in the past they would actually just use pluggables in a router across the dark fiber. So you can see that 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 um, but we always have to look at a network as a combination of different functionalities and we have to understand what is needed there. And if you do that, you will see that the picture is indeed colorful and there's plenty of room for, for separate WDM equipment for transponders and mux ponders and, uh, and aggregation switches and all these things that are separate from the router layer as well. So yeah, no question. Thank you, Harald. I think this really sums up very well uh, the, the challenges or the cooperation we can achieve with 400 gig. And I'd like to take a bit of up on that and go a bit a step back uh, maybe to the interconnection layer. So obviously Daniel as an IXP is probably the one most hurt by this, but we've all been talking about our own network for now, um, but eventually we will have to interconnect uh, with someone else. We want to appear as an IXP, we want to set up a PNI with someone. Uh, maybe, uh, and this is maybe directing more at, at Harald, uh, maybe we want to set up an alien wavelength on another provider system. Um, or maybe we want to do something completely else I can't think of. What are your thoughts on this? And um, I'm, I'm free to see who wants to start here. No one, Daniel, no one. <laughs> <laughs> what are your challenges? So as um, of today, that's not really our business, right? We run a layer two platform and you con can connect to us. Um, so standard is LR4 for 400G, for um, but we are not a provider of um, alien wave lengths as of today, at least. I wasn't uh, looking to highlight this at only alien wavelengths. I'm really 
uh, just uh, on the point of interconnecting networks. Where are our challenges? How, okay, how okay. far are we? Um, maybe Daniel, what, yeah. what are your customers? Is there actually is already a demand for 400 gig? Do you have 400 gig customers up that so, you can speak of? So, yeah, good question. So we started um, the support of 400G um, end of last year. Um, with the first line card available at the time, but the form factor and uh, um, yeah, the form factor was CFP8 with the LR8 on the optical side, and uh, there was just no um, demand for that. But now in the meantime, um, it starts, and I think we will uh, have the first customers running 400 uh, G end of this year, beginning of next year, and um, we try to use uh, LR4 for that. Um, but it's it's just not ready, right? <laughs> so we are just in the beginning of the rollout of uh, LR4 optics. Um, yeah, so the option is either LR4 or FR4 at the moment, but on the long run, we try to use uh, LR4 for sure. And at the same time, when we use LR4 for 400G, uh, uh, we look certainly at um, the single Lambda 100G LR. Are there also considerations to think about uh, offering a DR4 in the face where you can break out four times 100 gig that you can connect 100 gig basically on a DR4 or DR4 plus in the face with single lambda 100 gig to your customers? That's what I said before, yes. So um, when we going for 100 gig um, or 400 gig ports, um, we will be able to use 400 gig or even four times 100 gig from okay. the same uh, port, for same form factor. So that's the option to use um, the port flexible for what we need, 100 gig, 400 gig, maybe also 10 gig. Um, that's the idea behind the QSFP, yes. Mm. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. But there um, also a quick question, is power consumption of the optics something you take into consideration when you look at that? Because I mean, obviously a two kilometer optic uses way less power than a 10 kilometer optic. And two kilometers of um, You talk about the- In the data center, right? You talk about the customer connections or uh, in general? Customer. So for customer connections, it's, um, it's, it's also a trade off. So we try to have the same uh, optic for all the customers, um, but uh, we have a lot of data centers where uh, FR4 or um, even CWDM4, it's um, not enough. And it's the reason why we uh, go for the LR um, versions, right? But for the own equipment and connections, uh, for own equipment, we use the um, short reach op options uh, based on single mode. So CWDM4 and also FR4 for 400 gig. Okay, so Harald, is there something like uh, an alien wave possible or even other methods of handover to connect to an existing optical line system? Because I think too, too many of us out there having one 400 gig wave between uh, metros is interesting or yeah, on, on the long haul. Uh, but renting a whole cable, setting up an optical transport system might be difficult. But what are we looking at here? And actually, this is this is one of the topics that I was referring to er earlier in terms of the different mod business models that are out there. Um, uh, in, I mean, today, if 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 a network operator buys equipment, WDM equipment, they usually buy uh, buy something that they would call an open line system, which enables you to put different alien wavelengths across that system. That's become a basic requirement for any uh, metro equipment, certainly longer reach metro equipment um, and in many cases this extends also into some of the of the long haul applications um, so so that's that's become very important and it's become important not just because they want to sell channels to somebody as a as a as an alien wavelength but also because this enables them to evolve their network more easily going forward and this is something that maybe for the shorter reach connections is not so important but if you have a more complex network build out you, you, you've put into place, then actually having to replace your whole network every time you put a new generation of routers with new pluggables into place, it becomes something you don't want to do. Uh, that's why that's why people tend to separate functions in a way that supports their evolution path going forward. 
another reason why I'm not worried about us as a WGN vendor in this environment, because uh, because uh, people tend to put nowadays put a, a WDM layer into place, which is independent, which they can use to sell alien wavelength services if needed. In some cases, people are even considering uh, spectrum as a service service services where they say you've got so and so many nanometers of my spectrum, do what you want with it. Um, and um, and at the same time, this 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 provides them a bit of stable infrastructure they can use to to put, for example, different generations of optical interfaces next to that open line system, which often they try to keep independent from the routers because like that, they decouple the innovation cycles in different areas, which means that, uh, that for example, the line system depreciation will run longer. They will keep it in longer in place for much, much longer time uh, versus, for example, the router equipment or the, or the transponder equipment. The transponders basically line interfaces have an innovation cycle that is in the area of, of, of two years or so. You basically get to a new generation every two years, which is why uh, why we are starting to roll out 400G in an interoperable 400ZR form factor, while at the same time, we are also rolling out um, the, the higher end, higher spectral efficiency, higher capacity, 800 gig interfaces uh, that are not yet interoperable at the same time. And so you can see mm. the speed of innovation is only made possible by a very structured approach to building a network and separating it into different functions. So this is where uh, offerings such as a spectrum or a wavelength as a service also come, to, come into play uh, for, for many of the multi-service and, and operators and carriers carriers out there. So what I, what I also think is like when we're talking about alien waves, Technology-wise, it has been around for a decade or even longer. It's technology-wise doable, but from a business point, a business model point of view, I think a lot of decision makers were not aware that oh, we can offer a service called Alien Waves. Um, and uh, what kind of standard is that? Now, um, I, I assume the big players like here on the German landscape, they they have a DWDM network which have VoAs in place, which have, which have all all the magic you can do in an optical line system, they already have that technology, but they were still a little bit of fear to, well, we give now a little bit freedom away that someone else can enlight our fiber or at least a part of our fiber. Now, having 400 gig ZR as a standard as well, there is also on the counterpart a paper saying, well, hey, there is a standard for DWDM, which is great. And it's nothing, nothing proprietary. It doesn't give you the, the security that someone else will do nasty things for sure, but at least you have a standard then. And this might enable also more carriers to say, well, okay, we have now paper um, and uh, we offered the product of Alien Waves and not only two or three people in Germany. So this might be a chance that also big players and hopefully the biggest shouts now, oh, we're gonna be the first and then the others will follow, which will be great, um, uh, which would be good also for the community here. Okay, perfect. Um, I've uh, skipped a little bit through the, the chat and I saw that um, someone mentioned that Turk Telecom and CEO, 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 <laughs> sorry, are already um, offering um, Spectrum as a service. And of course, um, we built for uh, the last uh, Congresses um, um, between uh, Christmas and uh, New Year uh, for several years now, uh, alien waves through different networks uh, between um, Berlin and Leipzig to the Congress. So um, it, it's working with 100G networks. And uh, uh, when we're looking to the 400G optics, it probably might be easier um, in, in the future. And I see in the chat, there are a lot of more uh, carriers named uh, like EU networks, Colton, Retton, who also do uh, Spectrum as a service. So this um, might be indeed a new um, uh, product uh, to know to know about. And the second to mention, uh, someone mentioned that also Mellanox now in VDR are supporting OSFP, just to have that also in the in the stream. And then I think cool. from my side, I can look to Moritz. Yes. Um, so. Time flies when you're having fun, and we've been already uh, talking for 50 minutes. So um, I'd like all of us uh, to maybe come up with with a closing statement on 400 gigs. I know we haven't briefed you on this, um, but hey, 
That's the fun of it. That's the fun of being a moderator. So, uh, Thomas, as you're laughing, laughing, you, please, your closing statement uh, for closing. current gig and everyone else has like 30 seconds more to think about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Moritz. Um, no, it was really a pleasure having this round here together, discussion, discussing uh, opportunities with Fornic Gig. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, especially, it makes a lot of fun also. In terms for us, um, there will be new components in the transceiver as well. Uh, which are new challenges like the DSP. Um, never got my fingers to a D DSP so close. So this is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with with what we what we will see in the next couple of weeks and months. Okay, then Theo, you're next. Yeah, maybe I can add to this. So I remember the, the same, not this panel, of course, but the same disc discussion we had today. We had this with 100 gig, we had this. Um, with uh, kind of earlier standards and earlier speeds. But what I see, what I find really interesting is that um, we see a more standardized approach to things. And we also see, especially if you have a look on the audience and in the market here in Germany, we see more and more carriers like digging into this optical, optical world. So talking about offline systems, alien waves, that's all, at least to me, it feels like um, kind of also the smaller carriers and providers becoming more educated in in the optical world, and uh, this is what I think is a big, big driver for for the next uh, and upcoming uh, months and years. So we do not see only the big ones, the hyperscalers pushing this. Of course, they are, will keep pushing this, of course. Um, but um, we see more engagement from from let's say all our community here um, in in this field. Great so, to hear that you think that mere mortals also get a say. So we're ho we're hoping for that. Uh, Florian, you're laughing so kindly. Your last <laughs> statement. Um, I mean, also from from the Arista point of view, Arista is all about standardization. So um, it's we have exciting times ahead of us. Um, 400 gig is not fully spec'd out yet, as Sarah mentioned as well. Um, 800 gig is not not around the corner, although it feels like it, as Andy spoke about it yesterday. Um, but there. Are, as I said, just exciting times ahead of us. And I think everyone in the regular service provider carrier world can also benefit from the hyperscalers here who put a lot of effort into this, particularly around this like single Lambda, um, single Lambda technologies and also the power efficiency. It's, it is a big driver for, for our customers to get power costs down, um, particularly in the data centers. Network might be a small proportion of it, but it's still significant. So yeah, um, well, keep on looking on new technologies. Um, it was a great pleasure to discussing with all of you. And um, yeah, if, if anyone wants to reach out afterwards, um, OSFP is still the thing. <laughs> Bold statement here, uh, we'll not go into this again. Um, so Harald, first of all, we're glad to hear you're, you're still gonna have a job as DWDM vendor. Um, are there any other statements besides that there is still a future for you, which we are all very happy about? So am I. No, I think uh, for me, there's, I think, a way. I mean, first of all, 400G for me is there to, today. It's, it's today's topic. We'll see. I, I do believe that, that, that 400G has two major aspects. One of them is as a standardized solution that allows interoperability, which is important in allowing for open and, and, and disaggregated networks. Uh, um, which, which allows us to, to drive faster innovation. But then we also see innovation within 400G towards more, more interesting or more, more, more complex things like, like uh, 400G solutions, like, like um, providing, for example, aggregation into 400G, which is one of the things that we are working on. Um, but at the same time, this is an interesting thing because, because at the same time, the next line rate 800G is around the corner. And, and it, it truly, I, just like, like Andreas yesterday, I truly believe that's the case. We, we are starting to deploy 800G wavelength and, uh, and 800 gigabit Ethernet is, is also almost available. So, so I think we are, in a, we are again confirming that we are a very, very innovative industry. And, and that's something that's very encouraging to see even at this step in, that we are taking. I look forward to, to, to go through these changes with all of you. I think we all are and 400 gig and beyond are still unimaginable numbers. And especially as Andy yesterday uh, announced a switch with what 50 plus terabits capacity in two rack units. 
Um, I mean, DKX would love to have this on his traffic graph. So, uh, <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> when will we see 50 tera traffic peaks at DKX, or what is your closing statement on the topic? So, that's hard to say. I predicted 10 terabit for 2018, and I was wrong. So, no prediction for, for 50 terabit, right, from my side. So, yes, thank you for this round, and I hope we can do this again soon. And we as DKX will uh, get 400 gig up and running very soon for customers and also for our backbone. But I think it's only a small step, right? So we have to look what comes next and what's the next big thing. And maybe it's based on the OSF pay. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. I'll, I'll give you two room to discuss that later. Um... <laughs> this is going to be a dark room. I think so. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the program committee, I would very much like to thank Thomas who organized this whole panel. It's been great. We haven't had panels for a long time at DNOC, and I think it's a great way to listen in, to hear more than just one voice on, on a topic without bloating the uh, panel with three or five different vendors. Um, so yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, thank you to all our lovely panelists. As you can see, this panel, first of all, still lacked some room from an FTDH industry. Uh, we, we would love to have someone uh, discussing this with us. So if, if you want to reach out. Also, and this is not a critique to, to any of you beautiful guys, but this panel is lacking diversity and we'd also like to see that change. So if you want to speak at a panel, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to us at pcatlists.dnoc.de. Truly think we will uh, have another panel in the near future. Um, if you have an interesting topic, want to organize it, um, please also step up. We will gladly help and connect you to our community. And yeah, I think that's it from my side. That's it from, from this panel. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to the chat for great input. Thank you all for a great conference. And we'll see you all soon uh, in the closing. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.